Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I'm talking to the fabulous Jen Harrison. We're talking about a question that comes up quite often when I'm working with people. Do I belong in academia? We talk about why you do belong, (laughs) what you can do to help yourself and also actually why it might be academia that needs to change and not you. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Jen. Hi. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're a very busy person um, and I really appreciate you um, coming here to share your wisdom with us. So thank you. No, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about a really important topic, very common, this kind of question of do I belong in academia? Lots of people, that question comes up a lot for people during the PhD journey. So that we are going to dive into that in a minute. Um, But before we do that, um, as I always do, I'm going to invite you to just tell us a bit about yourself and your PhD journey. Absolutely. So um, so I actually did my PhD in the UK. Um, I have, you know, I was one of those people that always wanted to be a teacher and always wanted to be learning when I was little. And um, I did I actually skipped doing a master's. So I went straight into a PhD and I did a PhD in children's literature in the UK and I taught in. various universities and then um, after I had my children I actually did a UK secondary school um, training course and became a secondary school teacher for a little while and I taught a homeschooling business so I kind of I I run the gamut of different versions of teaching throughout my career Um, and then eventually we you know me and my husband we decided we would move to the US and so when we came here I was teaching as a professor in a college in my hometown and when COVID hit um, what I saw is that students were just not getting the support that they needed from their institutions. So everything had switched to virtual and the students who had kind of already been a little bit unprepared for their degrees, you know, before COVID happened, um, it, it was all kind of becoming very apparent that they just needed a lot more support at that point. And I decided to pivot back into having my own business. And I started the coaching business then in 2020. And that's what I've been doing ever since. So I've been um, supporting dissertation students. And so now I coach a wide range of grad students, but the bulk of my students are women of color, just like me. And um, I see my role as filling in all the gaps that their supervisors leave open. So they're often not getting enough actual instruction about what they should be doing. Um, They're not getting enough support to help them feel motivated. Um, Sometimes they just need a shoulder to cry on or they need feedback a little bit more quickly than their institutions can give it to them. They need help with goal setting and managing their time independently. So all of that kind of support is now what I offer to students who work with me. Amazing. Um, And so you said that, you, you know, women of colour like you and filling in the gaps so tell it can you tell us a little bit about your own experience then of the gaps on your PhD journey sure well you know what actually I was very lucky in my PhD journey so like I said I did mine in the UK which is a, a pretty different setup to it is here in the US and I had an amazing supervisor like he was there for me like we would meet more than once a week he always instructed me on everything I needed to do. He made sure my career was supported. So like, I don't have any horror stories to share about my PhD, unfortunately. I had an amazing experience and a, a ton of support. And I think that's why when I started seeing what um, students were going through here, I, I realized that it, you know it wasn't good enough, that they needed more. And that's why they were struggling because I remembered what my own amazing experience had been like. Well, it's not a for- unfortunate at all to not have a good story. We love having a good story because it is possible. <laughs> it is possible out there. So out of that experience, then, what do you think was the most valuable for you in, in your own um, journey? I think the thing that was really valuable for me was the fact that my supervisor was all about giving me the tools that I needed to work independently. So he didn't assume that I knew everything already. He knew that I needed to learn specific things. But he wasn't just focused on getting me to the end of my PhD. He was focused on making sure that I knew how to do what I needed to do, both in the PhD and for my career afterwards. So he made sure I knew how to research. He made sure that I knew what good writing looked like. Um, He made sure that I knew how to network and go to conferences and publish correctly. 
but he did that in a way that supported me working independently rather than, you know, holding my hand and, and just kind of getting me to the end and then pitching me out into the world. Um, Which sounds amazing. Well, we need to know. Fantastic. <laughs> we, we, need, we need to know so people can sign up and work with him. This sounds amazing. Um, oh, do you know what? I would, I would wholly recommend that, but unfortunately he's retired. Um, his name was Professor Peter Barry, and he wrote one of the like seminal um the theory book that everybody who studies literature in the UK ends up reading, um, Beginning Theory, that, that was his books. But he Professor was, Peter Barry, we salute you. Yeah. Come back. Yeah. We need 100% you. 100% do. <laughs> he was amazing. Brilliant. Um, what, what professors need to take a leaf from that book. Brilliant. So, a, so he, he was all about giving you tools. You know, he gave I, me the tools I needed. And I think that's kind of what's missing a lot of the time. Well, what I love about what you said there is not assuming that you know things because that's what often happens I think what what PhD researchers assume about themselves as well isn't it it's like I need to know everything and and I mean why would you you just started on something (laughs) so so this assumption that comes an internal assumption as well as often an external assumption but this this recognition that the PhD is all about learning that's a learning experience um, and to not expect that you know everything. Why would you know how to research? Why would you know how to network? Just like your supervisor acknowledged, you need to learn these things. And that huge part of the of the PhD journey. Love that. I love that, love that, love that. So this, this brings us into, I'd love to say neatly, because I'd love to believe that I can segue neatly into, um, into topics. Um, but this sense of do I belong in academia often comes out of that thing, isn't it? Of I don't know how to do this, therefore I don't belong. There's a kind of there's a there's a there's a um a, a connection that's made there for people, which isn't true. Um so this could this question of do I belong in academia? Yeah. Um yeah. sorry. Oh, I I was saying I think it does actually segue really well because I think that assumption is where the feeling that you don't belong tends to stem from. And it's the yes. assumption on both parts. But sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, I love it because you were complimenting me. So I'll, t- I'll take that all day long. Um, yes. So I, I know that I um, I see this a lot in 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 my work in terms of do I belong in academia? Um, and I, I think if you're asking that question, the answer is always a big yes. A bit of a spoiler alert. Always a big yes, because if you're feeling like you, you're working differently, that's academia needs you. So we'll just start with that. <laughs> but um this sense of, I, I, and I know that you see this in your work too. So I, I wanted to ask you about how do, how does this come up? What 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 are you finding around this, and, and what's your advice around this too? Sure. So um, I I think you you hit the nail on the head. Really, is that um, there is an assumption on the part of students that they should know what they're doing. Like they've gotten into this elite, you know, that the, the top of their academic game is getting into a PhD program. And that acceptance seems to come with this assumption that, well, you know, I must know what I'm doing to get here. So I think they start off on that kind of not quite right footing. And the institutions themselves often make this assumption that, you know, by the time you've reached PhD, you've learned all of these different academic skills. Um, You're now able to work independently. And of course, both of those things are not necessarily true. There's nothing. And again, I'm speaking from a U.S. context here because that's where the bulk of my students are from. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing in a U.S. undergraduate degree. There's nothing in a U.S. master's degree most of the time that prepares you for the level of work and the type of work that you're going to be doing in a PhD. Mm. Um, You're not necessarily taught how to find good sources and critique them. And you're not necessarily taught how to manage your time and to set goals and what the pieces of a PhD look like. That one comes up so often. Like People don't know what's supposed to be in a dissertation. Um, You know, they often have classes that are part of these programs, you know, oh, okay, here's how you do your statistical analysis, or here's, you know, how you write a lit review. But a class and your own research are two very different things. And the institutions aren't very good at like helping you join up the dots necessarily. Mm -hmm. So institutions assume they're giving you everything you need, and you should know what you're doing. Students kind of assume that because they're in this elite program, they should know what they're doing. And of course, neither of those things are true. And it leaves these students feeling like, you know, what am I doing here? Everyone else must know what's going on. If everyone's assuming that I know what I'm doing, then it must be me who's getting it wrong. Like I should know this stuff. I don't really belong here. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. Yes, yes, yes. It's a kind of weird sort of compliment, isn't it? In terms of, oh, you know, you're fine, off you go. Um, 
but also, I mean, I've said this before, this sense of if you turned up to a job and they went, brilliant, there's the kettle, see you in three years. Like, you would, this is insane. So, so, so yes, of course you need, of course you need that. Of course you do. Um, yeah. So what can you give us some thoughts on then how how do you start to work around that because that's a, that's a big thing when you are sitting on your own thinking i do not belong here everybody else knows what they're doing and i don't yes so um i think a lot of it comes from um the lack of support but then also this kind of unwillingness to ask for help and right. to advocate right. for yourself because right. you think you know what you should be doing yep. so a lot of my tips and strategies come with kind of overcoming that Right, um, right. I would say some of it's going to rest on you. Like some of it you're going to have to kind of hold on yourself, but some of it rests with your institution and making sure they are giving you what you need. Mm. So I think the, the first and like top tip if you're feeling imposter syndrome is stop, like don't. You belong in academia. You do belong in academia because you mm. want to be there. And mm. that's all there is to it. So go, go past, <laughs> yes, go past that stage. You know, stop feeling the imposter syndrome or put it to one side. Tell yourself, I do belong here. Now, what am I going to do to make sure mm. that I can stay here and thrive? Yes, so yes, yes. Be positive, be affirmative. Um, Don't compare yourself to other PhD students because I see that a lot, you know, oh, you know, such and such in my cohort is already finished with their lit review, and I'm still struggling to find my topic, there must be something wrong with me. Every PhD and every student is unique. Um, every topic is unique. Every project is unique. You cannot compare because you're not comparing like with like. So only compare yourself to yourself. Where are you trying to get? And have you made progress towards that goal? If you have, then everything is cool. Okay, that's the only comparison you need to make. I love that. Don't compare yourself to other students. I love it. And also, just because they finish doesn't mean it's any good, does it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, it's like it's there, there's these three things that come together when you're doing a PhD or any kind of doctoral degree, which is that there's like your own research and passions and kind of input. There's your supervisor's input and instruction and support and then of course there's your participants as well and what they give you and yes. Yes. when you think about the many different ways those three things could interact that's why I say every project is unique like you could have an amazing supervisor with all the support and be a really smart um, researcher but have participants who are just impossible to get hold of that's going to stretch your project mm -hmm. out and it's mm -hmm. not because you're no good uh, so any one of those factors can delay things or speed things up. That That's why you, you don't want to compare because you just don't know, you know, maybe that other person who's finishing really fast just had a really simple question and, you know, only three participants and may not have as good a study as yours. So don't compare. Love um, that. That's the first thing. I love that. And then like the next really big thing, seek and accept all the help you need without guilt. And actually demand the help that you need without guilt. Needing help is normal. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Once you have tools and support, imposter syndrome is going to start to recede because you're going to become more confident and you're going to start to realize as soon as you start to ask questions like, what should I be doing here? I don't understand this. Other people will put their hands up and say, actually, I'm struggling with that too. And you'll realize it's not just you. Like that a lot of the time it's that something hasn't been explained well enough in the guidelines or, you know, you're program needs to think about adding a class on this or maybe nobody's aware that there is support from the institution's um, library or you know whatever it might be but as soon as you start to ask the questions and seek out the help and seek out the support you'll find that usually it's that nobody was aware you needed help not that you shouldn't have been asking for it oh I love that and it's so hard isn't it for so many of us and I have got my hands up here to ask for help to ask for help culturally yeah. I think as well and you were saying particularly working with women of color with women we're, yes. we're, we're supposed to be coping and managing and not asking for help we're supposed to be helping other people and therefore like you say feel guilty when we're asking for help but I think generally especially in academia isn't it that you should be independent and able to do things all by yourself um is is the is the sort of cultural trope but this it's not true is it no it's really not and it's like there's a lot of um not only guilt, but like um, self-judgment involved in it as well. Like yes, you feel like yes. if you're asking for help, you must be weak or not yes. as good as everybody else. 
Yes. Um, but no, ask for help makes you strong. <laughs> it does. Absolutely. Like it gives you tools and it gives you processes for being better at what you do. It also gives permission for other people to get involved, right? And they yes. they that that could give them pleasure and you pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. That. So Absolutely. Um, yeah, I this is a, I, I as I say, I totally relate to that. It's a work in progress for me, but I, I know that when I do ask for help, how amazing that feels both ways around she so thank yeah that's a really important one and I'm actually going to say like that takes that takes two different forms because ask for help with your degree so you know ask for tutoring ask for instruction ask for more feedback um seek out the writing center ask the librarian for help with your research find a writing tutor or um, a proofreader to help you like get the help with your degree but then also like find your people and ask them for help with life you know Mm. ask somebody if they can do the laundry for you this week or watch your kids for an hour so you can study because people who love you and are in your life want to support you in those ways and even though it's hard to ask you'll find that they're happy to help and it it just makes everybody's lives easier. Well, let's say, and people are, you know, they'll be going, oh, my friend's doing her PhD and I, you know, I'm helping her do such and such. And it just, it will give them a buzz. Really, people love really to, does. love to help. They yes. Do. Oh, I love that. I love that as a tip. Perfect. Anything love- else, Jim? I do. I have one more. Um, and like, This one feels like a soft option. And I know a lot of people will kind of scorn it. And I was very skeptical of it as well before I started doing it. But it, it 100% works. Engage in affirmative behaviors. So do things like wind journaling, daily affirmations, um, mm-hmm. chat with friends about your successes. Um, I think there's research out there and I really ought to look up some figures and numbers and names and things, but about the the power of kind of being affirmative. So stating the things that are going well, stating the things that you've um, achieved, kind of reflecting on your progress or your um, achievements every single day, because it, it reframes in your brain that idea. I don't belong. I'm struggling. Everything's hard. I'm not doing well. And kind of reminds you that, yes, I am doing well, actually. I've done good things. The positive things are happening movement is occurring so like i'm i'm really a big fan of this like every day take some time to deliberately focus on what's going well i love that so much uh, oh the, yes 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 to that and yes there is research out there in terms of how how important that is and again this is countercultural, right because um what academia tends to do is go okay you've hands in that piece of work now let's now let's pick it apart <laughs> Yes. not go amazing you've had to do that piece of work just that's a piece of work rip it you know take it apart in it um and very bad at celebrating successes really not that's not the norm and actually you need to do that for yourself and especially I think I think it's especially challenging if you've come through an undergraduate program and you're used to being the high flyer and getting all that positive yes. feedback Every, you know, every week as you get your papers back or you're in a seminar and you're saying smart things and people are going, oh, they're good. Um, that actually when that's not around, that's we all need it. We all need that positive affirmation and thinking about, yes, how you're going to give that to your to yourself. You're going to give that to yourself. And I think especially also I know when I was really struggling those kind of really basic sometimes if you're in a really difficult place I remember a a time where I was kind of having to get to a point where I'm writing down you know I'm a good mum because I've got everybody clean clothes to wear today like really that basic stuff sometimes you have to come back to that don't you um to really remember no I am good I can do this it is all right yes to that Yeah. And actually, yeah, I I would say like, I've got one more tip that kind of comes off of that, which is remember that your, your doctoral dissertation is not your life. Um, Sometimes you do have to go back to those basics and like, okay, well, maybe I didn't write as much as I wanted to today. But on the other hand, I spent time with a friend who needed me and I managed Mm. to eat three meals. And, you know, those things are important too. So try not to let the, the degree take over everything. Yes, yes, yes. No, absolutely to that. And being yeah, that bigger picture, that yeah. bigger picture. Oh, I love this so much. So this sense of, do I belong in academia? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. But those things that you might want, practices that you might want to put in place to support yourself in that, because academia is not a particularly welcoming environment to anybody, I don't think. It's, no. it's quite a harsh terrain, isn't it? 
It is. And I want to go back to what you had said earlier um, in the program, you know, about the fact that um, we know what's coming when we get into academia. I think there's a sea change coming um, and that this next generation, if they start doing these things for themselves, if they start thinking about their own wellness and how they can get that life academia balance, um, that that will push that change forward. Oh, yes, so yes, yes. This, this may not be the culture at the minute, but it's still important to do because as you go into academia, you want to be the one pushing that change for better things to come. Definitely. And definitely. Oh, he, yes. Here's to that. Here's to that. And I think that knowing that, like, for example, there are lots of people every week listening to this podcast. You know, we, we get thousands of people every week listening to this. So you are not on your own thinking these things. If you're listening to this, you're not on your own thinking these things. And as you, as you say, Jen, let's bring on the revolution. Let, let it be different. Let it be different. And, and starting with the way in which you treat yourself, I think is really important, isn't it? Really yes. important. Yeah. Um, Oh, this is so good, Jen. I, there's so much in there. I was, I, 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 and I've, I am aware of time, and I don't want to sort of overrun. But this, this sense of do you belong? Those practices that you have in place. I wonder whether, because you've given us lots of good tips already, whether you have any sort of top tips to share with us um, around this. I think top tip is going to be lean on your people. So decide yeah. who your people are, and yeah. then lean on them. Ask for their help. Take whatever they will give. You can give back to them later, but yes. they will remind you why you are good enough. You know, those people who are there in your life, who love you and care about you. And like, that doesn't need to be family or a spouse, you know, whoever it is, your mentor, that person that you see at the supermarket every day that tells you you're great. Like whoever it is, lean on them. Wherever you see people who want to help you reach out, make those connections, take that help, thank them. Um, they will remind you, you know, they care about you because you are good enough. Oh, yes to that. Yes, to that. Um, awesome. Jen, thank you so much for this and so much for all this positive energy. Um, I'm loving it. I'm going to bottle it, take it with me today. <laughs> um, exactly. We're going to have all your details in the show notes so that people can make contact with you and, and find out more about what you do because it is pretty awesome. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Mm-hmm.